So, uh, bear, again, bear in mind that this is all the work of an excited amateur and not somebody who's got a lot of policy background. I don't study sociology. I don't study urban studies. Um, and I don't even study inequality studies. I read a lot of books, and I, uh, I've sort of tracked stuff and tried to get it all correlated. But I'm not, I could be wrong. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to try and show you data that I find significant and that tries to tell a story. Um, and so there are a couple key points at the start of all this stuff. The biggest thing from, I wish I had a whiteboard to write this down on or a chalkboard. What I want you guys to know more than anything else about American equality, and we're ta when I say an inequality, I'm talking about inequality based on class. So people with uh, fewer means, poor people having less access to a nicer life than someone from the middle or upper class. Um, gender, uh, women not having access to stuff that men do. And then race, um, which is anybody of any ethnicity other than white not having access to the stuff that white people do. Um, I have taught this stuff at St. Francis to freshmen for three years running, and it is always a dicey proposition. Like it's hard to think about this stuff, and I find it uncomfortable. The thing I want you to bear in mind as we start this stuff is that there is no, as far as I can tell from everything that I've been able to find, to talk about inequality, there's no single starting point. When we talk about inequality of access or cycles of poverty, you can't say that one perfect, one essential aspect causes everything else, right? You all can think of examples of people who were born into poverty who escaped poverty. You can think of people who are, you can think of successful women who have been able to overcome uh, the frustrations and the hurdles set in front of women. You've been able, you can think of minorities who've been able to come overcome the hurdles set in front of minorities. This isn't a one size fits all thing. What it is instead is this long series of data that has a whole bunch of correlations with a whole bunch of separate things. And it takes sort of looking at them globally to say like, oh, this is actually like, this all sort of adds up into a weird picture. Does that make sense so far? I'm trying to tamper your expectations so that when nothing works out the way you hope it does, you don't. Good, good. All right, so if you get like one interesting thing, I've, I'm successful tonight. All right, I, and, I, and I don't do, again, I do poetry and, and fiction, so I don't know how to do PowerPoint. My wife started encouraging me to do this two nights ago because she's like, you should show something. I said, all right. So if I mess up on PowerPoint, it's because I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, look at that. Okay. Don't tell us. <laughs> I'll make it look like I know what I'm doing. Before we get too far into this, if I want to share, um, so uh, I got into thinking about equality for a couple of reasons. Um, one, if you do creative work of any sort, if you're thinking about art or writing or whatever else, um, you end up thinking about empathy. Um, I can't expect someone who looks different from me to get into a story that I like unless I can somehow bridge the gap that separates us. We get this stuff naturally, right? Um, and through doing that, through having to think about that, you sort of get left wondering like, well, what, you know, when I, when my fiction writing friends or my poetry writing friends and I would sit around and talk about what we call like, oh, it's just a normal character. Well, what, what, is, what does that mean? And it's not to get all fuzzy or weird. It's just to say like, well, normal to me means a suburban white kid born in the 70s in Minnesota and that grew up in the suburbs. It's not a judgment. It's just what my normal is. Um, what happened along with that was that there were a couple numbers that kept coming up that I couldn't ignore and I couldn't, I couldn't get over. Um, and I didn't list them here, but I hope, if nothing else, you guys all leave here with one or two numbers where you're going, oh, that's a really bad number. Like, I, I need to think about that. I can't let that number go. Um, and uh, one last thing about all this stuff. When we're talking about inequality, I'm thinking about this stuff in terms of policy, um, meaning federal policy. How do we fight these problems? How do we try and work on changes that can overcome structural inequalities. Um, there are a bunch of other ways to think about this stuff, sociology, whether or not there are inherent differences between genders and races and everything else. I apologize if you're looking for that from this. I won't be giving it. I don't have it and I'm not interested. What I am interested in is how we solve it, real practically. So I should have asked this before I showed it, but um, one of the most surprising things when you think about uh, the way that class has worked over the last 50 or 60 years is when you think about the top tax rates. I appreciate that this might be the driest way to start, but I find this fascinating. And I, I know that you're not supposed to just read slides, and I apologize that it's kind of dull, but it, this is mind-blowing to me that as of literally 55 years ago, 
1963, the top marginal federal income tax rate was 91%. 91%, and that was if you made over $500,000. I'll get more into other aspects of that in a little bit, but if you look, what we can see over the last 50 some years is that the tax rate has been just destroyed, right? The top marginal tax rate for top earners in 1963 was 91%. Literally, 25 years later, it was 28%. The money coming into the federal government because of that is decimated, right? It is just destroyed. So I want you to have this in mind when we think about social policy and problems about how we see these crises come up in inner cities and uh, what we see in, in the drug problem and everything else in the 70s and 80s. This, to me, when you look at this stuff, is the start of it, right? And it's not just that there was this monumental drop. It was gradual. From 63 to 81, it dropped only 20%. From 1981 to 88, and for all of you adults in here who, like, I was 10. But I can imagine how my parents felt watching these rates fall this drastically. This is almost a, this is a 42% drop in less than a decade. This is astonishing, right? When we talk about social policy, when we talk about the ways that we try and help the most, the ones among us in society who need the most help, this is a huge problem, right? So this is step one. The other part about the tax structure that's really fascinating is this. The number of tax brackets, right? Right now, we are in a, an era where we have five tax brackets. There's, if you are fitting, you know, like if you make zero to $14,000, you pay X, and if you make some other, right, there's five different sections. In 1966, when the top marginal tax rate was in the 70s and 80s, it was, there were 33 tax brackets, right? It was much more finely tuned. As of 79, it dropped to 16, and then in 87, it dropped to five. Now, as you can think in any other context of your life, something that goes from being incredibly fine-tuned to being pretty broad is going to cause more chaos, right? It drops from 5 down to 2 from 88 to 90, and then it jumps back up to 3 and then to 5. So what we've seen over the last 50 years is this huge reduction in the federal tax, marginal, intro, mar marginal income tax rate, and this huge reduction and the number of tax brackets. What I'm not going to show you is a whole bunch of complex, I find it really complex stuff, but it's uh, the increase in loopholes and deductions coincide completely with the tax brackets, right? So you get tax brackets where there used to be more tax brackets and fewer deductions and loopholes, and now there are many fewer tax brackets and many more deductions and loopholes. Does all this stuff make sense so far? Okay. Now, now, how that get that way is what policy and interest, and I'm sure I'm sure the people that's making the most money has something to do with that. I, I, I'm not paying you, but I would love to. <laughs> but yeah, and but and this, so this is for me. This stuff, the questions about inequality end up being chicken and egg questions over and over again. Yeah. Did policy lead to this? or did this lead to policy? And it's hard to know the difference, right? I have inclinations, but I wasn't there. I was, you know, I, I, I'm new at this. This isn't my field, and I don't, I, I wasn't there. But what we do know pretty conclusively is that there's this impulse that once you get access to resources, you never want them taken away from you, right? When people in power get power to make rates that are beneficial to themselves, most of them don't want to not have that, right? It's hard to let go of. And it's really hard to overcome a lot of biological and structural things that say like, no, I should help out somebody else who isn't my family, right? It's a tough move. The way that we've decided to do that in the United States up until the 60s was to tax people, was to just say, whatever you decide is important to you is not interesting. What we decide as a country is important and we're just gonna tax people and we're gonna redistribute money. And now, I don't know how you guys feel, I feel like when I listen to the news, redistribution is a bad word. Well, redistribution is what <laughs> allowed my mom to become a, not a single mother on welfare and instead become someone who had a house. You know? So this stuff gets, but yes, you're right, it is policy. Um, and what this is showing, let me just, can you guys see this clearly enough to at least see the colors? So does everybody know what a quintile is? You can do the, Break down your head. Quintile is the, your top.
top 20%, 60 to 80%, 40 to 60. So this is the way policymakers and uh, planners talk about um, American income stuff. So the far left axis on this, I actually can't even see it on here, is 1965. I think it actually starts in 66, and the far right axis is 2015. And what this says is mean average household income by quintile, and then the top 5% is the dotted line. So as is not surprising, or hopefully is sort of surprising, the bottom quintile in uh, the mean uh, in 2015, yeah, can I, is this really, yeah. The 2015 mean income is 12,000, 2016 is 12,000. There's been very little change over time, uh, but what you can see clearly is that there is this massive change for the top 5% and then for the top quintile. So in real dollars averaged out from 65 to 2015, there's been very little change for the bottom 20%. It gets slightly better for the fourth quintile, slightly better for the middle quintile, a little bit better for the 60 to 80%, a lot better for the top 20%, and then really ridiculously better for the top 5%. And again, I don't, I feel like one of the things that is problematic when we talk about American inequality, when we talk about inequality studies, is that it shouldn't be a thing where you have to decide how you feel about it to get the information. I just want to look at the numbers. If we look, <laughs> these were all pretty close. Incomes for all five quintiles were really close in 66, when there were 33 tax brackets, and when the top rate was 91%. And then that goes away. And maybe just coincidentally, right about here in 1990, there's this huge takeoff. Right here is like 88. This is when they drop down to two tax brackets. And then it just climbs, right? This is when 88 is when it finally goes down to 28%, right? From here to here, the top marginal tax rate drops from 90% here to less than 30% here. And you get this, right? Now, maybe there's another explanation. All I want to see is the numbers, right? For now, this seems pretty compelling to me. I gotta say this, because here's a little illustration for your graph. This is like my life. In 1966, yeah. I lived in a neighborhood. It's just a neighborhood. Sure. There was a psychiatrist, yep. the vice president of Lincoln National Life Insurance Company, yep. treasurer of Lincoln Life, National Life Insurance Company, my father, who was an electrician, a widowed lady, and a man that owned a teeny tiny typewriter business. And we all lived in the same Absolutely. neighborhood. Yep. And I'm telling you, today, it wouldn't happen. No way. Yeah. No way. We could be here for, uh, yes, you're right. We could be here for days on that. And the way that we self-select, right? The, the repercussions on that based on education, based on the fact that schools get funded by property taxes is astonishing. The repercussions of this are staggering. There's literally no limit to where the ripples for this get felt. But you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, please. Excuse me, Wes, where, where did you get this? These are all from a bunch of different, so this is called advisor perspectives, but it's all a bunch of different white papers online and like, I am happy to send links, but I, okay, sure, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's that, and then I want to, okay, so, and this sort of jumps around, but I, my goal here is that you get a bunch of information and sort of like feel there to be a change rather than know or understand concretely how the changes happen, because the how isn't necessarily clear. One of the things that is obvious is, well, what's so, and I, I mean this in the kindest way, what's so bad about people in the top 20% making the most money, right? I mean, this is a fair question. And it seems that one of the answers that culturally we keep coming up with lately is we say, well, people in the top 20% or the top 10% or the top 1% make, they create jobs and they're the ones who, I, I'm shaking my head inside too. But they, I don't want to deny that there is, an, uh, there is a counter argument. I happen not to believe it, but everybody's welcome to think however they want. I'm less interested in kind of like a personal anecdotal data idea of that stuff, and I'm more interested in like what do we actually see happening when we break down data? What happens when there's this huge disparity between what the top 10 to 20% of people make and the bottom 20%? What happens when we break this down by quintile? Well, this is really gruesome, right? In the United States right now, it's, 
the difference between the top earning man and the bottom earning man can lead to a 20 year difference in life expectancy. Like, so you're doomed to 20, I mean, it's literally a generation less if you're born poor, right? So this graph says inequality in life expectancy widens for men. This is just from 1980. And I've seen other graphs that track it back to the early 60s. But if you look, the brown line at the bottom, the poorest, again, in 1980, which was, again, top marginal tax rate in 1979 was 70%. <laughs> so this is when things change. We can track all this stuff. When we start letting the tax rate go to privileged people at the top, we get this huge divergence. And so the poorest now average 76.1 years for, for dudes, for men. The top, the richest, make 88.8 .8 years, right? That's a difference on average, on average of 12 and a half years. So if you were born into wealth in a DC suburb, you get 12 and a half extra years. You could literally get a free degree on top of whatever you're doing, right? Yeah? It, a lot of that is, is greed. Is what? It's greed. I, well, look at it like I, this. Yeah. If the, if the people yeah. that own the company is making those big money, it's, it's clear that they're making money. It's not like the company. It's they're not they're, making money. You're right. And if you got enough money to not only pay your staff, but then hide it in somebody else's country, <laughs> still, some of it, you're doing pretty, pretty good. I'm just saying, you know, some of these companies, they could, you know, it's a shame that folks have to say, you know, we, we too, that, that work on the bottom, that help you make that money up there at the top, we too would like to live well too. I am with you. And what, there's a couple of things, it, it, yeah. I think it's a shame that we've had to get to the point where you have to, so to speak, knock on the government door to make the people pay us 15 bucks an hour. So, <laughs> yeah, right. I think that you know, it really is a sad commentary. I agree. I agree. And it, uh, you know, <laughs> as much as we would like to say <laughs> it that is. it is, it's awful, truly. Like, we can laugh about it, but like, yeah. the story, you know, the difference of 20 years, the story is of like Indian reservations, right? It's not white guys. Minorities that we've put on lands that we say, well, it's not that important. You guys get your own Indian police force and that's about it. This is really bad. And it doesn't seem, at least to all the economists that I've studied, it doesn't seem like this is required. It does seem like one of the functions of inequality is that it <coughs> makes everything worse for everybody. We are losing profits that we would otherwise be getting if we had less inequality. That's one of the weirdest parts about inequality too. So, well, the, yeah, yeah. The interesting thing is the uh, bottom <coughs> goes down. Actually, is declining. Yep. It's yeah, declining. yeah, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> well, we, Would you repeat your last comment? Yeah. So, if we, there have been studies showing, and this gets weirdly theoretical because there's not an apples to apples comparison, but if we had less inequality, we would have a greater general growth of GDP, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it this way, those of us who are in these brackets down here, if we don't have money to go to Best Buy and buy a new TV or to, to buy a new toaster, right, then the guy who owns Best Buy isn't going to make the profits that's going to help him. So it's, it's this weird sort of like, it's this claustrophobia where it's very, it's stuck and it seems that we have a lot of tax code to uh, keep going where the upper, basically the upper quintile, but you know, the upper 10%, the upper 5% to keep taking more and more. And it is, it is a limited pie, right? And by making it impossible or really hard for people in the bottom two quintiles to get ahead, we're making it harder for the GDP to expand at all. The point of all this is that it's actually deeply inefficient to be this unequal. This is men, this is uh, the life expectancy for women. This is actually much more gruesome in terms of the poorest women are making way, they're dying much quicker than they were in the 80s. Um, and, you know, women live longer than men anyway. And it, now the richest, the, richest, the richest quintile of women are living to be almost 92 years old. It's astonishing stuff. To me, it's astonishing stuff. If you go from 92 to 78, you get a 14 year difference between women who are in the top quintile and the women who are in the bottom quintile. I have a question. You yeah. mentioned the source of the white papers. Did you look at any of the white papers that address health disparities by um, race and income? Yeah. Okay, and then how did that 
This, so I'm just this the early stuff on this, and I, we're not going to get to all of it because it's already 25 minutes in. This is all just stuff on class. Okay. But a lot of that filters in that, doesn't it? Say it again. A lot of that, what she's asking, it kind of filters in that, doesn't it? This is where. Okay. I mean, because if you're making that 91% of your money, you you got that. Surely no, you can no, go to the I was, No, I'm talking about if you're looking at health disparities. Yep. Okay. By income and race. By income and race, yeah. Um, some of the white papers that I've looked at show even in equalizing the income. For, Black um, minorities still die here. Right. There's still Absolutely. the inequity. If, even, you, even when you balance that, and so I'm asking, did you find out? I haven't dug. I, I didn't do it on this one just because it seems easier to do the broad stuff right now. The hard part about talking about, uh, and I, I have found this in trying to teach this class a couple of times, the hard part about talking about inequality based on class and based on race mm -hmm. is that as far as I can tell, and I was born in 78, but it seems to have happened throughout my entire life and probably before me, unless I'm mistaken, policy has been set to make it, to make, to make it so that minorities are almost always living in poverty, right? Yeah, it is. I'm just saying, and when you get the minority person and you look at the person who's not in poverty, isn't there still a health disparity? Absolutely. That Absolutely. And it's, and it's and all... Why is that? What's that? And why is that? Yeah. I, I don't... I'm not, I'm not pretending I have any... I don't know why on any of this stuff. Most, more than likely because people in power like to keep it. That seems to be the most benign answer. Yeah. Because I've heard people say that. They say if two people rich, you know, the black man and the white man, they both, as far as the pocket were concerned, is about the same. Right. But when it comes to the health care, it just seems like the black guy still, with all his money, still get less care. That is true. Still. Black people get... Less care. Not only less care, they get prescribed uh, pain pills at a much lower rate. Their claims are less believed by doctors. All this stuff is easy to look up. Yeah. The biggest problem for me is that what you discover when you dig into these numbers is that black people, the highest scoring black students, highest test, like students with amazing test scores who are in poverty, end up graduating from college at a lower rate than poor test takers from wealthy white neighborhoods. So what we're seeing is that it is not, and this is where this stuff becomes really tricky for me. It's not about, it, it's, it's not, we can't narrow this stuff down to one thing or another. It's not just race and it's not just, mm -hmm. it's, it, when we talk about class, it's not just class because minorities have much worse times even if they're poor, right? And they have harder times even if they have a lot of money. So it's just hard. I don't, I don't know the answer to this. I can't, I can't. I'm getting a sense. Yeah, yes, yes, this is just, yes. Invisibly just doing stuff. This is like the bad Adam Smith, yeah. Uh, I wanted to put this up just because here's another thing that's fascinating. When you look at, this is the mean average household income, so it's really close to what we were looking at before, but slightly different. This, in 1965, the average CEO had a, a wage that was 24 times what the average worker's was. As of 2009, the average CEO had a wage that was 185 times the average worker. Like, again, that's policy to some degree. The government, which we decide what it is, could easily step in and say, like, it's, you can't do this. You just can't. You can't be this unequal when you pay your salaries. We choose not to. Can I skip some of this stuff? I feel like this is, like, getting, it, I feel like this is kind of bludgeoning. It's, this is still the same stuff about household income uh, and its changes. You can see the same graph. You're seeing the same results over and over again, right? There's faster, this is uh, the rate of growth, right? So the rate of growth is much greater for the top 5% and the top 20% than for everyone else. I got excited about these slides, obviously. Um, here's what's interesting, too. So in those graphs, this is sort of one of the ways to break down the numbers. When you look at this stuff, and this is all adjusted for inflation, meaning we're talking about this in 2016 dollars. The bottom quintile in America, the bottom 0 to 20 percent, they made their most money in 1999 and the average income was $14,200. And they've actually lost since then, right? In 2016 dollars, they're actually down to 12943 as an average. So they're down 9.5 percent, right? 
not coincidentally, the middle, second quintile, and top quintiles all had their best years in 2016. In other words, their best years are whatever year they're in. It keeps getting better because policy is stacked in their favor. For the bottom two quintiles, for the bottom 40%, the fourth quintile, their best year was 2000. 17 years ago, they made their most money. And since then, they just keep getting harder and harder to get out, right? Questions, anything? I just want you to see like the overwhelming numbers on this. This is why, for me, this is what's important. All right, so here's where we get into interesting stuff. And I wanna come clean on some of this stuff. My dad uh, hates unions, is an NRA member, laughs every time I talk about this stuff. So I'm not trying to say, I wanna make clear that like this isn't necessarily in my blood. This is a story, this, I say this is a story, but this is a graph about union uh, membership and union effects. It says union effects on non-union private sector wages. So, and I, I apologize that we can't make this bigger. Well, hold on a sec, let me see if I can make it just bigger on this screen. So it says at the top, it says additional weekly wages that non-union private sector workers would earn had the share of workers in a union remain the same as in 1973. Right. So, uh, some, again, this is somewhat hypothetical, right? You can't prove that the numbers would all equal out this way, but you can show conclusively through doing a whole bunch of analysis that if union membership had retained the rates that they retained in 1973, we would have much higher incomes, yes. right? So yes. I'm not saying that all unions are great. I, I, this is my, I'm arguing with my dad in my head while I say that, but it is conclusive evidence that when we organize, we are able to maintain a higher standard and get more revenue put into labor, right? I, I, I agree with that. I can understand why the company owner doesn't care for it. Unions, uh, of course, well, of course, that. of course. Well, that's the reason. Well, that's Go ahead, why? I, yeah. I mean, that chart illustrates the reason why. Because right. If I've got to share my wealth, well, then I won't have that great disparity. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I mean, I, I feel like this is, you guys would get this to anybody who's had a job for, you know, 20 years, you're going to see this stuff. For me, and for at least for the students that I end up teaching. Because the people that have, you know, unions, they, they did well. They did well. Yeah, they that was the heart of the middle class up until the 70s. Yep, yep. Absolutely. That's how it happened. That's how it happened. So uh, now we're talking about just general union stuff. And unions are an interesting marker for middle class life in general. The United States had this amazing thing happen in the post war years. We beat everybody in 1945, Nazism's dead, and we go on this tremendous economic run, right? The GI Bill starts, my grandpa comes home from North Africa after six years in the desert, gets to buy a nice house in the suburbs, gets to go to college, he gets to complete his degree at Purdue, has three kids, has a couple good jobs, has a really big pension, retires, gosh, I think he retired in 88, 89, got to goof off the rest of his life and hand a nice chunk to my dad when he died in 2008. The unions allowed for that to happen, right? In large part, the unions were what caused that to happen. But what we see happening after the unions stop having their power and after the tax rates start changing, and, and, and I don't know if you can do cause and effect on union decline and on tax rates. You asked before, you said before, like it's, you know, it's greed. And how does this stuff happen? How do they set the tax rates? I'm not sure if it's that the, labors became politically, the labor unions became politically weaker or if, if labor unions were made politically weaker because they kept having their middle class, because the upper class kept taking more funds and wow. taking it to that. I'm not sure, all of this, for me, questions of inequality are always chicken and egg. And then, you know, what, what lobbyists came in? Hard to say, hard to say, yeah. But so this stuff gets really tricky. So now we're looking at inequality based on just straight middle class stuff. The unions helped established United States middle class. It's an amazing thing. It's this economic engine that no other country's ever had. This is the chart that I was talking about before. This is students from low incomes, middle incomes, and high incomes. So if you look, and this is what it says is a top scoring low income student has about the same chance of completing college as a low scoring high income student. So this is the, per the graphs, the bars are the percent completing college. And this is the purple is low test scores, red is middle, is middle test scores, and pink is high test scores. So in low, low income, if you have a low score, if you're 
bad at tests if you're bad at the SAT, and you come from poverty, you have a 3% chance of completing college, which is, that's pretty terrifying, right? If you're low income and you take tests great, you get a great SAT, I don't know what the SAT score is anymore, but like, when I was a kid it was 1600. If you get a 1600, you still only have a 30% shot of finishing college. What's really scary about that number is when you look at high income students, in the lowest percentile, in the lowest scores, they also have a 30% chance of graduating college. You have the exact same chance. In fact, I'm lying. This is 29%. The low income is 29%. The high income is 30%. You are less likely to finish college if you are exceptionally bright in poverty than you are if you are exceptionally dim in wealth. I don't know how else to say it. Well, you know, let's face it, the kid, bad test scores, it's his parents' pocketbook that's still supporting him in school. I, I mean, he's maybe goofing off. I'm with you. Here's the thing. My, one of my favorite lines is the but plural. He has a safety line. I'm with you. The plural of anecdote is not data. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But just because that's what we witness doesn't mean that we can show it necessarily. Right. What's interesting is that we're all from Indiana, aside from Van Wert. Uh, and in Indiana, we've got this voucher system for schools. Like it or dislike it. What has happened with the voucher program, there's been the first longitudinal study done uh, of the voucher program, and what they've discovered is that there have been some, there's been some progress made in uh, English scores, uh, not great progress, made, there's actually been a loss in math scores. But one of the things they've been able to show is that the voucher program hasn't done what everyone thought it might do, because what we have thought about education has been wrong. What we have thought about education is that access to good education leads to good education. What we're discovering through the voucher program is that access to good education is nice, but a strong, wealthy family is more important. And that's terrible. That's terrible, right? If we're making it so that by the luck of some lottery before birth, you get told where you're gonna go in life, that's pretty awful, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, but there's a whole lot more I'd like to talk to you about the voucher program. I'm not, <laughs> not, I'm not saying it's good job. or bad. I just, <laughs> I have three. I have, that'd be awesome. yeah. I have three daughters, so this stuff for me is real. And, and we are in the lucky, my wife is a city planner. We're in the privileged position of probably being able to decide to send our kids to a Catholic school. I'm Catholic, it's great. It's hard to think about all the repercussions of that stuff. I don't think there's an easy way out of this stuff. So, I, I plan on, I thought that we would like have hours of talk and we're almost at 40 minutes and we're like through 10 slides. This is union density, meaning how many people are part of the union. And what's really fascinating about this to me is that we like to think, we have a president right now who talks about, everybody know the Make America Great Again? The, it, it would seem from anecdotal evidence that when people talk about Make America Great, mostly they're talking about this time period. Right, 40s to 60s, big economic growth, car in every driveway, new refrigerator, whatever else. Single, single uh, job. Right, right. Family job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The husband can work, the wife can stay home, right? We have this kind of like halcyon vision of this stuff. It coincides directly with union, uh, with union membership. And as soon as it starts declining, we see the evidence of all these other social fragmentations. Again, I'm not saying that this is causal. There's not enough data to show that. But it doesn't seem, <laughs> it seems like you would have to really hold your breath and really force yourself to believe that it's totally coincidental that things start falling apart in the 70s and 80s and progress thereafter, right? Again, remember the tax rates, right? 91%, 70%, 70% starts dropping. And then we go from this to this after it goes from 70% to 29%, right? I hope I'm not depressing you guys. This is a graph, I, I, it's not as interesting as it was earlier in the day, but this is a graph that shows union membership rates decreasing and middle class income shrinking, right? So this is a story that shows that the stronger unions are, the stronger middle class wages are, period. But how we establish middle class wages is through union membership. The decline of one leads to the decline of others. All right, this is, uni yeah, so this is another argument that, well, it's just union membership stuff. We're, by the way, the public union membership right now, or all union membership in 2014 is 
You know, another thing about union membership yeah. and, and it, when it's, it was high, is it forced employers to give higher wages to compete with those Absolutely. union jobs? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So the unions helped big time. Everybody. Everybody. Right. Everybody. All boats rise together on this stuff. <coughs> so one of the ways, I don't know how much you guys... Well, the easy question is, all right, well, why did unions start falling apart then? What happened? And one way to think about that is that we stopped making stuff, right? The United States lost a lot of jobs to offshoring. We stopped a whole bunch of steel mills in Ohio. We just shut this stuff down. It was cheaper to make elsewhere, right? And so we canceled a bunch of union membership jobs and keep going elsewhere. Well, the GDP didn't contract in those years, right? I don't know how much econ stuff you guys want to get into, but the, the gross domestic product didn't shrink. It stayed stagnant some years, and it shrank a little tiny bit at different times. But the money went somewhere. This money was out there. Well, so where did it go? Well, it went to banking. No. No. It went to banking. It went to banking and insurance. So one of the key things to know about the ways in which inequality has happened in the United States is to think about the financialization of America. And I don't... What that term means, the financialization means, that what has happened is that I, don't, I, I couldn't find a chart for it in time, but you know, if you think about each industry and what percentage of GDP they account for, so like I'm in education, I, I don't know what the a percentage of education that accounts for total GDP stuff, but it's got to be somewhere in the low teens or like high single digits. Manufacturing accounts for some percentage, service jobs count for some percentage, everything accounts to GDP, everything that goes into your domestic product. What has happened since the 80s, right? Again, since that magic time period of the late 70s and early 80s, where the tax rates really radically shift and start privileging the people at the top, is that a lot of money goes into finance. A lot of it. it goes into insurance products. It goes into stuff like collateralized debt obligations. It, has to go, it goes into all the stuff that crashed and tanked the economy in 2008. So this is a tough graph, but I want to try and get at it because I find it amazing. So this graph shows how the total economic cost of financial intermediation grew. Inter intermediate just means like you hire a, 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 an accountant to do stuff for you or hire a, bro a broker to trade stocks for you. The total economic cost of financial intermediation grew from under 2% in 1870 to nearly 6% before the stock market collapsed in 29, right here. It grew slowly through the post-war expansion, reaching 5% in 1980. Then, beginning the deregulatory years of the Reagan administration, the money flowing to financial intermediaries skyrocketed, rising to almost 9% of GDP in 2010. 9% of GDP goes toward paying bankers and stockbrokers and analysts to do stuff with money. And instead of having a steel mill, or instead of my dad having a plastic factory in southern Minnesota or working on Nordic tracks in Chaska, there were dudes clicking mice and making transactions. And those, that money existed. It just went a different place. This is a, it's, I find this graph hard, but it's, to me, it's wild. It's wild. And this, this is, that's the uh, left axis. The right axis on this is kind of fascinating. It says income share of the top 1%. In other words, where, are, where is the top 1% making their money from, right? And if you look, the top 1% uh, made a really good amount of money from financialization stuff in the 20s, right? This is the big cutoff here is the 20s and 30s. And it falls way down here. And again, once we get to the deregulatory years of 1980, it starts to go way up again. The top 1%, that story about the neighborhood you grew up in, mm -hmm. the top 1% used to be much more broadly representative, right? There used to be teachers and doctors and lawyers. I can't think of any neighborhoods where the top 1% isn't Wall Street. I lived in New York for way more, I, it was awful. When you go to New York, there are neighborhoods that are dictated entirely by Wall Street guys. It's just Wall Street, <coughs> right? Okay. So this is, uh, anybody know what the stock market is today? <laughs> 24 and a half, roughly. It's odd because, you know, if I, I feel like the stock market is always sort of a weird marker for 
when you were born. Uh, when I started paying attention, I remember it was a big deal when the stock market broke over 10,000. That was during, I think it was during Clinton years, but it might have been during Bush's years. This is a show of the U.S. stock market capitalization compared to GDP, right? So for a long time, I can't, I'm sorry these numbers are so small. The U.S. stock market was 40, way back here, the U.S. stock market was 40% of GDP. And now it's way past 100%. So the stock market is bigger than GDP, right? Which means that we put more money into this sort of abstract thing that's only accessible through financiers than we do through, than we do to steelmaking or whatever else. Why is it important to talk about where money goes? Why is it important to talk about union declines? Why is it important to talk about the financialization? There are a couple guys who do these studies. Uh, Ken Ho Lin is, an, is one of them, has got a partner named Daniel something. We'll see him on the next slide. But I want to read this just because it's kind of amazing. Ken Ho Lin says, evidence suggests that increasing investment in financial assets crowds out investment in the workforce, right? In other words, if we decide to put a bunch more money into trading desks at Merrill Lynch, uh, we're going to see less money going toward steel workers or less money going toward factory workers or teachers or whoever else, right? The growing dependence on debt reprioritize, reprioritizes the order of distribution, heightening the need for workforce reduction. In other words, once banks get big enough and they start working in large numbers that are, large, that are primarily about debt and assets and just balancing those two things, then the question about whether or not labor is people having jobs or labor is a number to try and minimize so you can maximize your exposure to risky transactions that lead to big rewards, that becomes important. The increasing rewards for shareholders replace the retain and reinvest cycle with a downsize and distribute spiral in which labor expenses become a primary target of cost-cutting strategies. This is sort of a fancy way of saying that once you get into this sort of feedback loop where people at the top are earning more and more money and extracting more resource from their companies, they're going to keep doing that. And the spiral of that is going to make it so that people at the bottom get less and less. This is a way of saying what you've already seen countless examples of. And then in a different paper, and the paper he wrote that for says, did financialization reduce economic growth? In other words, is this new focus on having all of this money go into banking as a percentage of GDP, is it actually limiting our growth as a country? Might the GDP be even higher right now if we didn't spend so much money on investments? I'm making money. Say it again? So we're spending so much money in making money. Well, that's a nice way of saying it. I think some people make money. Yeah. Well, you know, that some of that money that we're spending in making money can take care of the GDP, the debt thing. Absolutely. Well, hopefully, yeah. I, I would think. You know, yeah. Some, some or we'd have money. less debt because we'd actually have money You're coming. Right. You know. That's what I mean. Yeah. We would have less debt. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. We'd have to take out less debt. Yeah. As the New Deal regulations were slowly dismantled, the financial sector growth accelerated along with risks and speculation. Again, this is sort of an explanatory stuff for slides you've already seen, but it's worth paying attention to. The employment and total sales, this is mind-boggling to me. The employment and total sales of the finance industry grew from 10% of GDP in 1970 to 20% by 2010. In 40 years, as a factor, as a percentage of GDP, banking doubled, right? Think about it. I mean, I know that we live in a time where Facebook is disruptive and Instagram and everything else, but banking as an industry went from being 10%, one-tenth of the economy, to one-fifth. Guys, healthcare is one-sixth of the economy. Those two things alone account for 38% of the GDP. That's astonishing. At the same time, the manufacturing industry fell from 30% of GDP in 1950 to 10% in 2010 meaning all the gains in finance is more than wipes out all the people in, in manufacturing. The finance industry swelled as the rest of the economy weakened. The disproportionate growth of finance diverted income from labor to capital. Labor is doing work and getting remuneration, right? I show up, I teach a class, I go home. Capital means you have nice tax rates, you get born into a family where you get a trust fund of $300,000, you're lucky enough to be able to invest it, you never work a day in your life, and you make more than enough money to cover it forever, right? Does that make sense? Not really. <laughs> Sincerely? No, it doesn't. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Wall Street profits rose from less than 10% in 1982 to 40% of all corporate profits by 2003. It's worth paying attention to that again. Wall Street profits rose from less than 10% in 1982 to 40% of all corporate profits. In my state, we have uh, 3M. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, up north we've got steel mills, the last good going steel mill in the country. All corporate profits, all of them, Apple, Microsoft, everybody, banking accounts for 40% of all profits as of 2003. And it's grown since then. This is astonishing stuff to me. What's that? But it's a very small group of people making money. We can show that later on, but what's happened, consequent, what's happened at the same time as this happened is that people in the bottom two quintiles, at one point, you know, folks like my mother-in-law who lives next door to us, she, you know, she was born into a middle, eight, middle class life. Her grandpa and her dad, and it was only guys then, had stocks and pensions. What's happened since the 70s or so is that there's really no access to having equities if you're in the bottom two quintiles. It's really unlikely. If you're in the bottom two quintiles, you just don't have access to equities. You don't have access to the stock market. So when you look at something like this, the GDP, GDP share of the US financial industry, in 1860, it was 2% of the entire GDP. And now it's way up here, right? It's 8%. It's crazy. This stuff, I, I, can, I shouldn't, but I could go on too long about this. OK, and so these are, this is again, are you guys tired of the financial inequality stuff? We can do race stuff, too, and gender stuff. It's all gruesome. It doesn't get better. It's just going to get worse. Yeah, let's be done with the financial stuff. Yeah. That's too small. Yeah, unfortunately it is. You can see uh, all these graphs that I'm cycling through, you're just, you should just look at it and be like, oh, it just gets worse. <laughs> Here's your question before. Life expectancy by race. 1970, this is, I mean, it's I, hard to imagine that we live in a country where we decide to look at something like this and think it's unimportant, or at least not important enough to solve. All races, as of 1970, uh, they generally, you know, there's not a decline. We're doing all right, generally, for everybody. But for black people, it's remarkably lower. It's 7% on this lower, right? This is staggering that we allow race like this to happen. And so, and again, I have a, I think it's probably obvious that I'm white. I want to talk about this stuff in a way that doesn't, make people uncomfortable and I don't know how to do that. And I've tried and I've had students really frustrated with me and I don't, I don't know what to do. So instead of trying to argue anything about meaning or causality, what I would like to do is just show you some recent examples of things that have happened. So does anybody know what redlining is? Great, let's talk about redlining. What is redlining? You guys all know what this is? Great, so redlining is when, uh, does anybody know who did it? Who? Yeah. So the federal government did redlining from 1964, or 1934 to 1968. They did it earlier too, but from then it was, absolutely, absolutely. I've got four win on this actually, it's kind of fascinating. So redlining was the, pro for those of who don't know, redlining was the process by which, um, uh, it was, um, what, what federal agency was, F -H -F, it was F, yeah it was, yeah it was the Federal Housing Authority and they would come around and they would go through neighborhoods and they would grade them and they would grade them from A to D, and if there were any minorities, and at that point it was like, you know, Jews and Irish people, but primarily black people, if there were any minorities, they would circle it in red, and they would give it a D. And uh, there's a really great uh, contemporary writer named ta Coates who wrote an article two years ago or three years ago in The Atlantic called The Case for Reparations, and in that he talks about how the legacy of redlining is still so deeply with us. I don't know if you guys saw the movie Spotlight about the uh, sexual abuse cases uh, among priests in Boston, but the Boston Globe has this outfit called uh, Spotlight, 
and they just dig deep on stories. And their most recent story was on racism in Boston. And the legacy of redlining is still with us. It's in the air we breathe, it's in the water we drink. If you're in Flint, it's in the poisoned water you drink. This is New York City. This is Manhattan, this is Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, so it's different counties. So this is Manhattan, Kings County, Queens. The red spots are areas of high minority concentration. Uh, they're high, you know, they're where minorities live. They're where black people live. Or Latinos, but primarily in New York is black. The green dots on here are Hudson City Bank locations, places you could go to get a mortgage and buy a house. Now, I'm not saying that Hudson City is independently responsible for racism and the perpetualization of inequality in New York, but here's what's fascinating. Hudson City Bank branches that opened between 2004 and 2015, and I know that it's hard for you guys to see, but these green dots represent them. So you've got green dots here, 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 here. That's the closest to red areas there, way up here, and way up here. If you know your geography, you know that up here is really, really nice territory. Like we're in Connecticut, we're in all the places where Wall Street guys live. Conspicuously absent, absent are places where minorities have access to go and get a mortgage. And so this is just tip of the iceberg stuff. We could spend days talking about the repercussions and the problems that still exist from redlining. This is up here because this was a federal case. These guys got slapped with a $30 million fine from HUD because they flagrantly uh, discriminated against minorities and they made it impossible or unlikely to get a mortgage with that company. This is the same government well, yeah. Let, let, let's be clear. This is the same government who said that, you know, black people were three fifths and that didn't allow women to vote till 1919. The government has made terrible mistakes. And the goal isn't to try and be perfect, the goal is to get better. So, yeah, it is that government. Problematic as it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is an explanation of that. On September 24th, the Justice Department announced a settlement with Hudson City for close to $33 million after an investigation found that it was avoiding doing mortgage business with African Americans and Latinos between 2009 and 2013. The Justice Department calls it the largest residential mortgage redlining settlement in its history. Um, one of the U.S. attorneys involved said, if you lived in a majority black or Hispanic neighborhood and you wanted to apply for a mortgage, Hudson City Savings Bank was not the place to go. They serviced one of the largest housing markets in the nation covering mortgages throughout New, Jer New York, New Jersey, and even Philadelphia, but the bank went out of its way to not set up branches in minority neighborhoods. So, for the record, as part of the repercussions of this, they have to open two full-service branches in non-white communities, which hardly seems... Yeah. So, if we all had our way. If you guys already know what redlining is, then we don't have to talk about it. Um, but this is an explanation. Redlining uh, sounds like an old-timey term. This is by Emily Badger, by the way, whose name I would write down. Emily Badger wrote for the Washington Post for three years. She writes for the New York Times now. She is hands down the best writing about inequality, specifically in cities. Redlining uh, is a practice that exists only in history with our retelling of it. The, but she's saying that's false. The word has particular roots in the 1930s when the government-sponsored homeowners loan corporation first drafted maps of American communities to sort through which ones were worthy of mortgage lending. Neighborhoods were ranked and color-coded, and the D-rated ones, shunned for their inharmonious racial groups, were typically outlined in red. What's weird about this stuff is that there's still a whole lot of evidence, not just in banking, but like, there's still retail redlining. For instance, Domino's Pizza distributes software to its outlets to let them flag addresses on computers as green, which means you can deliver to them, yellow, curbside only, or red, which means you don't have to deliver to them. Domino's Pizza now says that you don't have to deliver to red zones inside of cities like this. It's a little on the nose. Businesses defend the tagging as a reasonable response to the threat of sending easy to spot delivery personnel with cash into high crime areas. But again, we're back to this cause and effect question. Are these places high crime areas because they've been abandoned by the structures that we rely on in nicer parts of town, or do we not have those things in those parts of town because there's high crime? It depends on your point of view. You can come to your own conclusions. Oh, 
we got to make this bigger. This is Fort Wayne. This is the red line he meant for Fort Wayne. This is amazing. Uh, so I, I, this is obviously downtown. This is Calhoun. Um, my wife and I were thrilled to get this today. The 1930 and 1940. Red is hazardous. <laughs> uh, C is definitely declining. B is still desirable, and A is best. Um, and so you'll notice, like, here's Foster Park, right? That's the best. The areas surrounding it are still pretty good. Kind of amazingly, this area right uh, to the west of my, I live in Williams Woodland, this neighborhood is like Beechwood Drive. It's right next to the old Lutheran Hospital. That was considered still pretty good. That was a B. And then downtown is red, and all this other stuff is yellow. This, by the way, is right off Pontiac, this little red spot. I mean, What's I don't, I couldn't, I didn't, this, no, that's not fair. I could have zoomed in. I'm, I am a south side person, so I didn't bother looking. Uh, I apologize. I should have. <laughs> Kirkwood Park? Yeah. Is it still nice? Yeah, it's, it's not the neighborhood. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I found this fact, like the fact that we can still recognize these places, and in, and I mean no disrespect, in bigger cities, I'm from St. Paul in, in Minneapolis and Minnesota, the contemporary maps lay out almost identically to redlining maps. Espe Chicago is the same way. Even before the interstates in Chicago, in fact, the neighborhoods that were worse were the ones, the neighborhoods that were redlined were the ones that are still bypassed. And it's the kind of, yellow is one there? The yellow is like, if you have a little bit more money than to get out, if you can get out of the redlining places, you get to go to the yellow places. Oh. They're definitely declining. My neighborhood is definitely declining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is what year? 30 and 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's really interesting, too. Uh, and you may talk about the 1950s and 60s during the Eisenhower administration. Uh, Kenyon Bar is a good, good example of a neighborhood in Cincinnati where they built um, six highway interchanges about over 10,000 homes in a minority redline neighborhood. Yep. So the whole point was just to get rid of the neighborhood. So they, they did that in Minneapolis too. So 94 came through the Cherokee neighborhood in Minneapolis and destroyed what was a thriving community, but... Detroit, uh, they did that as well. Exactly, yeah. So this is a city planning thing, but it still applies here too. I mean, the Chicago is the same thing. <laughs> the United States in various factions has tried desperately to make these communities go away, right? We... <laughs> send surveyors out to look at neighborhoods. We decide that because they have inharmonious racial groups, they're gonna be redlined, even though there might be something that we don't understand, and then we try and destroy them. I wish it were better. I wish I didn't have to just say it that way. Okay, so this stuff, I feel like we've covered enough ground that you don't need me to read this stuff. We all know, I guess it's worth paying a little bit of attention to. Everybody knows how schools are funded, yeah? Schools are funded through property taxes. So the effect of redlining is brutal on schooling, right? If you live in a neighborhood that has historically been redlined, even if there's a process of gentrification going on, more than likely your schools are bad. Um, the evidence of this stacks up overwhelmingly across the country. So what ends up happening is that neighborhoods that begin as being primarily black or racially inharmonious, meaning they've got anybody that some white surveyor doesn't like, any neighborhood that features people other than white are going to have a harder time growing. They're going to have a harder time being able to. And to be clear, the effect of redlining in neighborhoods meant that you couldn't get a mortgage in those neighborhoods. It meant that if you had the means to get a mortgage, you couldn't go there anyway. The bank wouldn't guarantee it. So it effectively blocked access for people with means to get into those neighborhoods. It destroyed those neighborhoods. And consequently, it destroyed the schools. But you could get a loan in those neighborhoods if you were black. They, if they made it a lot more of, they made money more of it. You could take the same house in a red zone and a yellow zone. If you were black, you could buy the house in a red zone. If you were black, you couldn't buy it in a yellow zone. This is where is it gets complicated. Am I right about that? I don't know. For sure, this, but I think basically what you said is true. Yeah. This is where it gets more, yes, you would get a better rate, it would be pre but it would be almost predatory rates, right? If you're, oh, paying, sure. if you're paying 25% interest on a home loan, oh. I mean, are you 
at that point it becomes, you know, like, and the, so the, the uh, contract, buying houses on contract, which was a, a method used in the 50s and 60s in Chicago in redlining neighborhoods. It was white people who would own the homes, sell them to black residents on contract. But if they ever missed a single mortgage, the whole of their investment went away. So yes, if every single thing worked out perfectly well, there was a chance that minority families could own their houses in redline neighborhoods, where it would be worth much less and the schools would be terrible. But more often than not, there were so many hurdles set up that it made it impossible, functionally impossible. But yes, it was not unheard of, but it was so hard. It was so hard. So I want to skip some of the, I mean, I feel like the obvious repercussions on education is sort of obvious. Some of that is still as though the depression years too, is there? The redlining became significant. Like 1932 to 1940? 1936 was when it took off and like became a huge deal. And it was used federally by banks. That information was done by the government and used by banks to guarantee or not guarantee mortgages until 1968. Mm -hmm. So for two, like essentially a full generation of black families were denied building up wealth right. while everybody else, all white people were allowed. Well, I mean, it's 200, I mean, it's half a million dollars, right? It was just withheld from black and minorities. I mean, that's, that's, it's, that's it. There's no other way to talk because about it. Because even blacks, black men that, that served in the military couldn't get that FHA loan. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's so correct. Got, you know, to build wealth, wealth to pass on. Yeah. Or to buy another home. That's totally true. You could get an FHA loan, but you couldn't necessarily buy it if you want to buy it. Buy it. Yeah. I don't know how to get into talking about race and class because as far as I can, and we're out of time anyway, but when we start talking about race and class in the country, we're talking about two things that have been so f intentionally tangled for so long that it's hard to even know how to disentangle them and talk about them separately. Question. Yeah, yeah. Could we agree if you were willing to extend the speech of another 20 minutes? I'm happy to do whatever, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Here, my, my, my inequality for the night is that my wife is at home with the three daughters, so I can do, I'm good. We can. But if we could extend it for another 20 minutes, it might give you a little bit more time to. I don't have more, this. I mean, Did this stuff. I thought you had some other topics as well. Well, I started doing all this inequality stuff, and then I realized that it was getting too big, and I, 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 I don't, again, because I'm not a scholar at this, because this isn't my field, I don't know how to present it coherently. There's a lot more that I would love to say, but I don't know how to do it and I don't know how to present it. Like, I, there's no flow for me. It's just, <laughs> someday. All I would say is that when we talk about, when we talk about minority experience, and I, I, I almost feel bad saying minority experience. Yes, there are experiences of Latinos and of uh, Native Americans, but when we talk about what the consequences of minority experience in the United States are, we're talking about the black experience. We're talking about African Americans. And it's silly to pretend otherwise, truly. Like, in terms of policy, this is what we're talking about. Um, and so, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't include. And, and part of it is that, I, again, I teach 19 to 23, 24 year olds, sometimes non traditional students who are slightly older. But, like, every time I've taught American equality, I've had a young white male, always. Uh, say, well, black people just commit more crime. That's why uh, they get arrested more. Like, they say black people commit more crime. Oh, okay. So I'll say, like, why is there such a racial disparity in, in criminal justice? Why is it that, so like when I said that there were a couple numbers that made me start paying attention to this stuff, the number that still kills me, I, I'll, never, I'll never work through it, is that uh, it's 33%. 33% of black men, um, you know, of a certain, from age 20 to 34, born in 1980, will spend time in jail. Um, for white guys, it's less than 7%. So the same crime. Well, that gets really interesting, right? So like, what is it? Is it because uh, uh, black people are by nature more criminal? Is it because we've designed a whole bunch of uh, structures in society that make it so that black activity, see, so we've essentially criminalized blackness? Uh -huh. You know, when we have rates of incarceration from selling powder cocaine different from crack cocaine that seems significant when we have uh you know 
hippie enthusiasts in Colorado selling pot, and we've also got a disproportionate number of African American men arrested for selling pot in New York, that's a problem, right? Yeah. And I don't know how to talk about that. I don't know the way to talk about this stuff. I can give you guys quotes and numbers till I'm blue in the face. I can talk about how if you have what's considered a, a stereotypical black sounding name, you're six percent less likely to get a call back on an interview for a job than if you have a white sounding name. Yeah. I mean, or the application for housing. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so is this stuff, a, is, it, is it an effect of, of blackness or poverty? And the thing that I hope that you guys can come and do your own research, find out for yourselves, but from what everything I've seen, we have tried at a policy level in the United States to make blackness and poverty identical. And one thing that is um, part of the red line is yeah. institutional racism. Absolutely. And that's a difficult thing to jump around, but that is the reason. Can you explain what you mean? racism is the reason for red line. What, can, what, do you, just, what do you mean by institutional racism? Because the FHA, an institution in the United States, oversaw red line. And that was an institution in this country that monitored it, promoted it, and continued it. Absolutely. And so that's just one example. And, and to be clear, the FHA didn't do it alone, right? right. The FHA had help from business. That's just that's right. They had help from all the insurance companies. They had all the help from all the banks. Sure. They had all the help from all the police unions who made right. sure that there were sundown towns, right? I mean, these things were enforced structurally at so many, I agree, there's so much institutional racism for me when I start looking at this stuff, I can't find evidence of when there was not, not structural. And there, from, from what I can tell, there still is Systemic. a ton. If you add, see, here's an interesting thing. Uh, well, that's actually, forget it. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a specific enough example, but you're right. Yeah, well, I, brought, I identified because of so many times the elephant in the room is, oh, we don't want to say that. But it's, it, it's not like overt racism of black and white water fountains and things like that. It's something that's systemic and built in and supported by institutions, yep. such as banks and the federal <clears throat> government, is interwoven. And that we need to somehow have the conversation of how we address it. Well, you were saying you're, you're not a couple. I'm not saying you as in you standing there. I'm talking about in general. So what do we do oh, with that? So I teach this as a class to freshmen. And like the first day when I start talking <coughs> about this stuff, like the class is like, mm -hmm. by the end of class, you're like, I don't want to be in. Like, we'd rather be anywhere else. The, what's interesting about this is that the way, at least from my experience, the ways that we talk about racism depends on a certain amount of emotional buy-in, right? It means that white people are going to have to stand around and finally say like, hey, we've had a lot of access given to us, right? It's going to demand that my dad, who was born in 1951, as a white dude in Minnesota, has had a lot of doors open for him that he didn't see were open, and that there was a wind at his back that he never felt. And he didn't see how it was pushing against his black friends or his, his female friends. But for me, the interest, like, I, don't, I want to get to a point where we don't have to all, I don't want to deal with the emotional part of that. I don't feel like some people are ready for it, and I think it's silly. What we can do is just look at the numbers. The structural racism and the institutional racism you're talking about, we can just show it. Mm -hmm. Well, you already did with that slide with the 141 Southern Democrats. Absolutely, who, yeah. Who, uh, they made sure that Social Security did not cover domestic workers. Okay. Yeah. For the record, there's, a, there's a, a group right now working in Fort Wayne to try and track police profiling of minorities. And guess what? We're just like everywhere else. Fort Wayne arrests way more black people than white people, based, based on representations in, in, in population. I appreciate your efforts to try to take the emotion out of the discussion. Sure. I think, and I appreciate looking at the policy. Sure. Who creates the policy? Why does policy created, how the policies impact the population. Sure. Whether it's tax policy, whether it's favoring the rich, whether it's moving jobs out of the country, who makes those decisions, who benefits from those decisions, what's the public policy that supports those decisions. Sure. And that's, and what I'm getting from this discussion on inequality is that these are public policies that promulgate the inequality. Absolutely. And so you ask, what do we do? Right. We need to look at 
how we support or refute these public policies. I tend to think that our most current public policy is regressive. It is. In a major way. But we have to be clear, that's, regressive isn't a judgment. That's actually just a term. The current tax policy that was just passed is deeply regressive. It's taking money away mm -hmm. from poor people and giving it, like that's the definition. Yeah. When we talk about racism, we pretend that it's a judgment, but it's not. If you are judging someone based on the color of their skin, you're being racist. It's not, it's not a soft someone term. If you color of their skin, you're being, you have racial prejudice. Racism is racial prejudice plus the power to affect people's lives. Okay. This, to, but this to me is like. We did talk about that just the other day. But, but so the racial prejudice, everybody has. Everybody has it. No matter what color you are. I'm going to leave. Racism is the institution. It is, it affect it, that, that's right. The people that have the power mm -hmm. and the racial prejudice, they have the power to affect people's lives. Yeah. I, I think All I would say about that James Bowen said. Sure. James Bowen yeah. said that wealth, uh, I, God, I want to say it like he said, wealth mixed with power makes a ferocious enemy to justice. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Makes a ferocious, ferocious enemy. So is is all these things you said? If we could come back some of that, mm -hmm. if we would say, okay, we won't, we won't like. These these uh, tax laws now horrible toward your everyday James and Joes. It, it's sure. a shock. Can I wish someone would say, "Well, look, you know how unfair this." Is. And I do believe that the ones that implement it knows how unfair it is. This is why they did not want to score. They didn't want no the sure. no meeting of sure. mind. No, 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 no. Just, just, just go for it. Just rush it through. Just rush it through. All all I would say is that this stuff ends up being useful at a policy level because it doesn't demand on an emotional buy-in. In my experience, and I've only done this with 60, 18-year-olds, is that it's really hard for a lot of people to talk about it. And I, that doesn't excuse it. it doesn't, I think that it's important. To, I would love nothing more to have really gruesome conversations about privilege. I'm a white guy with two degrees. I would love to have those conversations. Like, I think it's important for me to be able to tell my daughters, like, hey, we're really lucky. We worked, but we're really lucky. I think that would be great. But I think in absence of that, and given how much anxiety there is built into it, I think that it's smart to try and start a place where no one can argue, and no one can argue with numbers. We are brutally unfair to African Americans in this country, and we have been for a long time. And we can either acknowledge this stuff and look at it, or we won't. But I, th I think that in terms of policy, yeah. when we start applying race or our perception of race on these policies, we start looking at things differently. How do you mean? Well, I think we start putting value on it. This is, well, you know, I think that person is not doing his fair share. Right. That person is getting special treatment. Right. You know? They're getting handouts. They're getting handouts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but if I look at the regression effort of the policy, see that it's not just black Americans who negatively impacted by these policies. It's all those people in that 20 and 40 percent. Those middle quintiles are all getting hammered, yeah. They're getting hammered. Yep. And yet said, I support my congressman who says we should imply, we should um, develop and promulgate these regressive policies. Because I said it's okay. Because I don't understand how they impacts me. You don't understand how they impacts and that's the, that's the sad part. That's sure, that's yeah. Just my, no, know, no, I yeah, yeah. You voted for that person. You know, like, oh, yeah, just beat me over the head some more, please. <laughs> what do you say? You know, one of the, one of the biggest eye-openers that we personally have found is a book by Robin D'Angelo. Okay. What Does It Mean to Be White? Yeah. And, um, you know, she talks about... Um, being white is the water that we swim in. We don't, we don't know it's there. Sure. We've, we've, we've been in it all our life. We don't know what it, you know, if all of a sudden we were jerked out of it, and then we would realize it was there. But Sure. Uh, but we can jerk ourselves out. I mean, get on the red line in Chicago and go south, right? I mean, you can get jerked out of it. 
Yes. But this would be a really good book to introduce you to King Mills. <laughs> Yeah, this is where I get, my shortcut with them is that anytime they say normal about their own lives, it deals with some examination. Most often when we mean normal, we just think, oh, this is what I'm used to. More often than not, when white people say normal, they mean white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. What were you going to say? Yeah. So, we can lay out all the facts, and as a planner, that's what we're supposed to do. Sure. But at the same time, we were told last year, facts don't matter by our own presence. <laughs> so how do we... Alternative facts. I mean, that was brought up, and the yeah, yeah. inauguration, a million more people were supposedly there that weren't yeah, yeah. there. So yeah. that's I, changing the way we have to talk, and how do we do that? It's changing the way that I had to teach us. I had a student yeah. this year in class who uh, is in alignment with some of the harder elements of the current administration, and like everything that I, like we read the long Pulitzer winning prize stories about the school districts in Tampa, and at the end of it, he just said, I don't believe it. I'm like, what? Well, everyone else agrees with it, and verifiable facts support it, and it was deeply investigated. So, like, at some point, I don't know. For an educator, that's the scariest thing to confront. I have no idea. All these guys are teachers, too. They can answer the question. I don't know. I have no idea. So how did you deal with that? I told him he was wrong, and I hoped he would come back and talk to me once he figured it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't... At some point, we don't need to play with kid gloves when people are just wrong. Like this stuff, I, the last slide up here is stuff about, and I, again, I'm evidently white, and man. 74 was the first year it was illegal to, be, to refuse to issue a credit card to a woman based on her gender, which is sort of stunning to me. Women couldn't serve on juries in all 50 states until 1971, and Columbia didn't allow women into its university until 82, Harvard in 77, Princeton and Yale in 69. When you think in terms of access, and one of the things that we didn't get really deeply into is the distinction between income and wealth. Income is what you make, wealth is all the stuff you have. Uh, the Spotlight story in Boston and the Globe recently showed that on average, I'm not making this up, this is not a typo. On average in Boston, it's something like a quarter of a million dollars in total wealth for white families. Anybody want to guess what it is for black families? It was $8. It's not a typo. It was eight dollars. So what we see is two or three generations removed from the worst days of redlining. and we see evidence of that lasting still. So when we see black families unable to build wealth and to do the thing that we consider the American story, which is build wealth, make your life easier for your kids, give them a little something, a nest egg, and move on, have a nice retirement, black, we have kept black families out of that enterprise. And we have done the same thing to women, right? And I don't feel like this is news to any of the women in the room, but like, it's sort of stunning to look at this stuff and realize how recently we kept women away from everything, right? So this has got to be the, I, I'm happy to stay and chat all night, but I, this is the end of the serious part.